Okay, so this is a um, young patient. She's 24 years old. And uh, I'm gonna start off by showing her scan from a while back. So this is from about 10 years ago. She was a young teenager this time. And uh, she came in with abdominal pain and she was found to have a huge uh, SM, uh, SMA uh, aneurysm. And I don't have imaging of that at the time. I think it was a, at a pediatric hospital, but I do have imaging shortly after the surgery. So the aneurysm was resected. And um, so this is after the resection of the SMA segment where the aneurysm was. And to so scroll down, I'll just show this what they did for her. So if we scroll down to the bottom, the first vessel that's gonna coming up now, the first vessel is gonna be the inferior mesenteric artery. And they they put this um, this this graph right here. So this is a saphenous vein graft uh, that they attach right above the uh, uh, right, above, right above the IMA, and then they anastomose most of the distal aspect of the resected um, SMA to supply the SMA uh, region here in the mesentery. So, uh, so then she was lost to follow up for for quite some time. I, we did have one scan from 2017, so five about five years later, and this is what. She, and then I actually. The the CT the axial images, I guess didn't make it across. This is the only thing that came across was this, but it should be good enough. The only the only thing to note was this this kind of narrowing here of the mid aorta, at the time was noted, and then um, and then again she wasn't she was lost to follow up for a while, and then this is her most recent scan the the last scan the third scan from um, about a week and a half two weeks ago, and. I'll share that one. So she's coming in now, ten years later, with uh, with hypertension. Uh, and so first, I'm just gonna on and show the region where that graft was. So coming up from the from the bottom up, this is the inferior mesenteric artery, and right above it, that graft that was there, the saphenous vein graft, is completely thrombosed. And that's not completely unexpected because saphenous vein grafts don't last forever and it's been 10 years. But she has to compensate for that. She's developed this large collateral here. Uh, so this is arc of real N peripherally. So the, so the IMA is now large and it's collateralized with formed collateral to supply the resected SMA. But the, uh, the other interesting thing on this on this uh, scan is this worsening, severe worsening of her uh, abdominal aorta uh, here below the level of the renal arteries. So you can see this severe narrowing here of her abdominal aorta, and then there's a circumferential soft tissue, and now there's uh, occlusion of the left renal artery. So this is presumed to be hypertension, uh, renal vascular, and then the diagnosis here was made of uh, mid-aortic syndrome, which is a Kind of a rare acquired uh, disease in young patients of this age group, where they have severe narrowing of the um, inferior abdominal aorta, and you can get occlusion of uh, major arteries, major branch vessels of the abdominal aorta. And in most cases, it's idiopathic. So that's the first case. Can, uh, sorry, can you? So it's, it's really just the mid aortic because I've seen a couple similar cases in, in kids with hypoplastic left heart where the entire abdominal aorta is really diminutive. I haven't so so I haven't seen other cases of specifically of this diagnosis, uh, but but what I what yeah, but it's basically it's most what I saw in the literature is it's they describe it as the base usually it's the inferior abdominal aorta. I didn't read anything about like the the whole aorta. But it's it's pretty rare, and it's not. It doesn't seem like it's not well understood, as far as what causes it. Okay. Next case. These are just a few quick ones. So, uh, so this one radiograph here, and we have a tubular opacity here. These are easy to notice uh, just in looking at it in retrospect. So there's a tubular opacity here. And then if you look carefully, this left upper lobe is uh, hyperlucent compared to this right, to the right side here. 
And then so I can show the C key chest. So, so here's the tubular abnormality that we saw. And here it is in soft tissue. And, um, and then if you look at the, the upper lobe, it's hyperlucent. And if you, if you pay close attention, it's, it's hyperexpanded. So this is a good example of uh, bronchial atresia uh, where you have an atretic left upper lobe uh, bronchus and you have a bronchocele here that's formed and you have hyperlucency of the left uh, of the left upper lobe uh, with uh, air trapping and you got air drift from adjacent segments drift air drifts into the into this uh, apex here and causes this hyperlucency and expansion and here's the chrome and so you can note the hyperlucency and expansion of the left upper lobe. That's a great example of bronchial atresia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. Okay, uh, another quick one. So this is, there's a large infiltrative mass here uh, in the mediastinum. Uh, it was diagnosed as a biopsy in squamous cell cancer and it's completely it's invading the it's invading several structures here left atrium but it's notably it's completely obstructing the superior vena cava and we have all of these uh, collaterals which we see not not too uncommon with such syndromes we have vena venous collaterals here um, but this was a really good probably the best example I've seen of the focal uh, hotspot sign in the liver that you can see with SVC occlusion. Uh, also hot quadrate sign, you can see the nuclear medicine also. But uh, just sometimes it's fun just to follow some of these collaterals. And um, so if we focus on, on this coming from the top, this internal mammary vein here, or internal thoracic, down you can follow it and it, and it goes inferior to the liver and then it, it comes up and you can see it collateralizing here with the portal system of the fourth segment. And then it makes through the portal system, it makes its way into the contrast or blood makes its way into the IVC and then back to the right atrium. Um, so wasn't, so another collateral here that, uh, yeah. No, sorry, go ahead. I'll have to make a comment at the end. Okay. And then another uh, more subtle thing that I noticed here on a second. Um, so and I was looking for this specifically. So right there, I think this is an example of, uh, and it's pretty subtle, uh, of a uh, little collateralization with the, with the, pulmonary vein right there mm -hmm. see a little bit of a little small little shunt, uh right to left shunt yeah. collateralization into the pulmonary vein but i think we you guys have shown better examples of that um i know that's it for this case uh, one comment about that comment? How uh, when i see the tumor there that looks like mediastinal or extensive mediastinal mm -hmm. tumor, and they say squamous cell, uh, that should bring a little bit of a bell, because that's a very unusual place for a squamous cell cancer, particularly if they it is driving it to a squamous cell of the lung. One particular tumor, which is rare, but um, to under the microscope may look like a squamous cell carcinoma, is the NUT, nut not midline carcinoma. Mm -hmm. So when I see that, because it often has very squamous features for a tumor like this, mm -hmm. I suggest the possibility of the not midline carcinoma. And certainly for pathologists, this, how many does one see? They may not recognize that this is an unusual place for a lung squamous cell, if that's, if that's the assumption. Um. Yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah, and then so I was, I was, I um, 
I looked into the pathology and they weren't sure what the primary was for this one specifically. I agree, it's it doesn't look like a typical location for a lung. I didn't, yeah, but that's a good point about the nut. I, I wasn't thinking about that at the it, time. It, but it could also it can also be a squamous of the a thymic carcinoma with that right. squamous, right? Exactly. I mean, pathologists really struggle to differentiate between what the etiology of the squamous is. They just see squamous cell carcinoma. So um, I've seen a lot of thymic squamous cells that are just called pulmonary squamous cells, and they're clearly not. So that that's another possibility. That's another possibility. Yeah, this one's unknown. But uh, yeah, both of those are definitely good thoughts. Okay, and then I have one last one. So this patient is a 64-year-old lady, and she has um, history of scleroderma, kind of limited scleroderma with Raynaud's, and um, also reported history of Sjogren's in her chart. Um, she also has pulmonary hypertension. You can see the big, the big PA. Uh, she's had a long history of shortness of breath, but it's been getting worse over the past um, two months. So she comes in and this is her uh, chest CT. And then the most striking abnormality here are all these little um, kind of smudgy ground glass nodules and they they look central lobular. So the main question here becomes, are they vascular, are they vascular or are they from an airway? And uh, I think it's definitely possible they're vascular just because they're so um, diffuse. So then next question is what is causing them? And um, some of my colleagues suggested, and I, I think it's reasonable, uh, PCH um, with her pulmonary hypertension. And that's something that uh, can be seen with scleroderma. There's an association. So. I think that's reasonable. She was worked up for pulmonary hypertension um, like five or six years ago, and they did a um, left heart, uh, a, a, a heart, a right heart cath, and uh, yeah, wedge pressures which were slightly above normal. Uh, pulmonary pressure, the RV pressures were were kind of mild to moderately elevated, forty. Um, and she was on sildenafil for a while. Um, but then, uh, but then on the other hand, she's slightly older than the typical age that usually PCH and PVOD happen. And and then there's also, I mean, you can see the ground glass nodules definitely can be seen with that. But there's no, you know, there's no septal thickening. It's usually associated with the PVOD variant here. Yeah, um, I think. Then the other thing I noticed, yeah. I think it's just PAH, right? So scleroderma is a common cause of group one PAH, and that is a very common cause of those smudgy nodules. It doesn't look pch -y to me. Okay. Um, I, I think it's just PAH related, um, mm -hmm. kind of blushing. Um, yeah. I don't know if others would agree, but. I, uh, yeah, I agree with you, Seth. I saw a similar case like that, where it's just just really subtle smudginess, not the, yeah. the nodules and it's, nodules are much more. And it's extremely common with scleroderma, yeah. extremely yeah. common with scleroderma. Like, I don't know why, I mean, so I don't know why scleroderma causes um, such severe type one PAH, but of all the collagen vascular disease, that's the one that's listed. Um, and it's, yeah. So I, I, uh, I concur. I think that this is uh, plexiform arteriopathy. And one of the clues is that within the some of the smudgy ground glass things, you'll see this little bright dot of a dilated artery because you get you get these tiny little central lobular aneurysms of that of that pulmonary arteriole accompanying this plexiform arteriopathy. So if you scroll down, you'll see that there's sudden tiny little um, aneurysm within you know a crisp aneurysm within the ground glass. That's uh, I think it's almost certainly plexiform arteriopathy. Okay. And um, the other thing I noticed in her chart was that she has chronic pain syndrome and is opioid dependent um, and she has bipolar diseases. Is, is there any consideration for excipient lung here with this or? No, I don't know. So. Those lesions are usually crisper than these. These are okay. yeah, like a flex form okay. arteriopathy. Yeah. And then there's no central line or anything like that here. So, okay. Okay, that's it. That's all I have. All right, thanks, Peter. Those were excellent. Thank you.
Okay, who would like to go next? I'm available anytime you like. Okay. Oh, okay, I have to um, grant application uh, system preferences. Let me do that and go into someone and then try me a, a bit later. Yeah, I think you'll have to log out and log back in. I, I can go if you want. Sure. Nothing super exciting. Um, this was a case of someone coming in with a chronic cough and has this kind of, I don't know, not too impressive, nice rounded endobronchial lesion with some distal either mucus plugging. It's not hot, super, it's really not high density, a little high density, nothing dramatic. Um, and anyways, she underwent a, and I thought it might be a carcinoid, it kind of looked benign, or just even some chronic mucus plugging, but uh, kind of had a more rounded appearance in some areas. You can see it here. So definitely concerned about an endobronchial mass rather than just mucus. Um, and this turned out to be a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Uh, you know, definitely in the differential, it's the right right location for it. Um, you know, those can be quite aggressive, but uh, fortunately they often present earlier than more central tumors. But uh, yeah, just a little mucopodermoid. And the this is a case I sent, because um, I was getting, this is just from yesterday, getting very uh, interesting feedback from my Clinician. So this is a guy who was uh, a power lifter on steroids, presented a about a month before with okay. severe chest pain, um, and had an end, had a STEMI, not an end STEMI, a legitimate STEMI, and was diagnosed on the cath as having a coronary dissection. So they sent that you know they treated him and then this was at an outside hospital he was sent here and he has the diagnosis of uh, a coronary dissection they're like assessed coronary dissection and I'm looking at this you know it's a good history we all know that anabolic steroids definitely or wait you know usually scads occur in women younger women associated with peripartum or postpartum but in men it does occur and one of the common associations with men is people on steroids and then also uh, I mean, power lifters, especially those on steroids. So it's a good history. But if you're looking at this, um, you know, parts of it could definitely look like a SCAD. So here we are on the transverse short axis to the vessel. But then you get into other areas and there's, you know, some question, there's, there's some low, you know, that's calcification. That's atherosclerotic disease. Um, here's an area of severe narrowing, or this is actually just moderate narrowing. But if you look at the there's extensive positive remodeling here, and there's a lot of low attenuation plaque, which is not the typical appearance for SCAD. SCAD should just look like it's a fuzzy, basically an intramural hematoma. Here's another area of atherosclerotic disease, um, another area of non-calcified plaque with a low, kind of a, kind of a what we would call, think of pathologically as a vulnerable plaque. Like, so the things we look for to assess what we think of as a plaque that, plaque that may be vulnerable is not only the areas of positive remodeling. So this whole thing is the vessel. This is, and but the low attenuation plaque as well. Um, here's another really nice area showing, this is the area of severe stenosis that he had, but this whole thing is the vessel wall. And this is this really severe low attenuation plaque and here's the vessel. So not really typical for a dissection. Uh, and then the thing that kind of really clinched it for me was that there was also disease, um, if you look at the RCA, if I can, there were, so here, there were areas of non-calcified plaque in the RCA as well. And he also had a ramus, which had some areas of non-calcified plaque. So, you know, even though that was the history and there are different treatments, right? You don't usually want to, you try to avoid 
Uh, you can stent um, a dissection if you need to, but you really try to avoid you know, a cath and excessive manipulation for, for fear that you're going to propagate the lesion. So here's some non-calcified plaque in the RCA. And he also has some disease in the distal LAD as well, which is quite remote, very, very distal. Uh, right here, kind of goes away. So anyways, I, I told him, I said, ah, this is just atherosclerotic disease. You know, we know that people on steroids get accelerated atherosclerosis, and they basically told me, no way, it's a coronary dissection. Um, I sent it to uh, Travis and also my friend uh, Brian Gashadra at Mass General, and they both independently looked at it and both thought it was atherosclerosis, which makes me feel a little better because my cardiology colleagues think I'm FOS. But uh, anyways, and you know, here's the, some disease in the ramus. So this was a, I was excited to see a coronary dissection, but this was just bad atherosclerotic disease with exuberant uh, vulnerable plaque and a weightlifter taking steroids. So Jeff, how old is this guy? 39. Wow. Yeah. 39, big, big dude. Um, actually, you know, I was surprised. I was commenting. He wasn't that big. Like, I've seen a lot of power lifters. They have big pecs. But anyways, he described himself as a power lifter. I was going to have to take him out for a bench press contest. His um, pecs aren't that big. But how about, his, how about the career of his diaphragm? Because weightlifters get... Yeah, like no, he was, he was like, I looked at him like, this guy must be a power lifter. He was huge. Um, uh, so, let me see right. if I, I'm not sure I have that. I didn't download the full field of view. Okay. Um, you could, you know, I didn't download the full field of view. Sorry. Uh, I, but I can look and uh, let you know. And, oh, sorry. That was a different, wait, no, that was, no, that was the right case. Um, and he also has, I'll send over the mo function, he has uh, wall motion abnormality in the LAD territory, as you would expect. And then this is uh, just a really nice example of, you know, disease states that go beyond um, when you would normally see people alive. I always love seeing unilateral transplants, not because for the patient, obviously bilateral is better, but for the fact that you get to see progress, disease progress beyond any state of which anyone should be alive. So this is a patient with, um, you can see this areas of bronchiectasis, uh, kind of some airway center nodules, uh, hyper attenuation uh, or hypo attenuated lungs. Um, and she had constricted bronchiolitis. No one knows why. Uh, she doesn't have a college of vascular disease, no inhalational exposure. But anyway, she gets a transplant. And now this is, um, uh, let's see how I scroll through this. So this is the um, now our you know the dynamic expiration where the left is the transplanted lung which contracts normally, and the right is the transplanted lung or sorry left transplanted lung right's the native lung which doesn't doesn't move at all. And if, I'll show you in a second the axials where you can really just see that there's just no almost no vasculature. So complete shifting over, there's no change in the attenuation of the right lung at all because there is no movement of air. Um, and then here's the, the lung windows. So you almost, yeah, I mean, there's, and in some of these really severe cases, and I don't know why, um, <laughs> similar, it's like the re, kind of similar to our, uh, some of the, um, Evoli cases where you get this pronounced hypoattenuation around the airways, um, these dilated airways. And I, I've seen this in a couple of times in some of these really severe cases. Like again, here you can kind of follow this hypoattenuation out around the airway. Not sure why that is, but anyways, that's it. All right, I love the dancing lung there, Seth. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, Howard, you good to go now? I'll try. I don't know if I fixed it. So it doesn't seem to um, want me to do this. So, do you guys get this thing? Go to meeting would like to capture this computer screen. What does that mean? And I don't seem to be able to open my system preferences. It seems to be locked, which is completely weird. So, anyone have any insight into what this is all about? 
one thing I know is you have to get a Mac OS permission to share your screen or something like that. That usually asks for access to that. You see it with Zoom and other ones too. Um, and usually you have to kick out of the application and restart it. Okay, keep on going. I might not be able to uh, get it fixed today. I've yeah. never seen this before. Okay. Well, I can go. All right. Thanks, Brian. Make you presenter. Uh, I don't know if you guys see my screen yet. Um, that's weird. We do, yeah. Oh, we did. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. I, 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 all right. Do you see it now? Yeah, I see a bunch of different images. Okay, great. Um, so this is just a, a third time follow up. This is a, a guy with this hypervascular mass here, uh, kind of a, a between the uh, aorta and the, the root of the aorta, the MPA. Um, and I turned this a couple times before, um, but I got some some better follow up now. And this is the time resolved MRA um, showing just just how hypervascular it is. This is the fuse images from the PET um, showing how hot it is. Um, and uh, here they finally got an MIBG, and it, and this is the MIBG, and it's very 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 uh, hot on on that. Um, and interestingly, they did they finally did a 24 hour urine uh, collection that was normal. Um, uh, for meta ne metanephrines, but then they did fractionated plasma and found elevated um, uh, dopamine uh, in his in his fractionated plasma. So I I I, I presented it earlier as you know I'm not sure what this is, but I uh, thought it might be uh, a angiosarcoma because it was so big uh, and and looked aggressive. But I'm I'm now totally favoring. Uh, paraganglioma. Um, and these are pretty rare lesions. Uh, I'd never seen uh, one in real life before. And so I pulled up a, a, a nice paper uh, from, uh, I think this is the one of the AHA journals, I think the Interventional Cardiology. Uh, and uh, in, in here, they show different a few different images. Um, you can see here uh, some angio images, and I'll show you in a moment uh, some of uh, my, uh, uh, some similar uh, cath lab images. And, and so most of these usually arise in the wall of the left atrium. Um, but then they talk about here that a lot of them also go uh, within the, the branchiomeric uh, paraganglia, um, including the aortic pulmonary and then around in the uh, coronary arteries. Um, so I think that this is probably uh, one of those. And when I came back to it and looked at it again, um, this is the T1 fat sat double inversion recovery. I had previously thought this was all hem uh, was going to be hemorrhage, um, but in looking at it again, you know, I'm wondering maybe it's not. Maybe it's it's some other uh, some other thing that's causing intrinsic T1 shortening, because um, this area also enhances. The only part of this lesion that doesn't enhance is the central hypo intensity. Um, so anyway, I thought that was interesting. That's the pepper. That's the pepper of the salt and pepper, right? Those are the vas. <laughs> no, it is. Those are the vascular flow voids. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. No, they talk yeah. about these being salt and pepper lesions. That's exactly why. Those are the, the dots of pepper. And this one is just has a lot of vascular flow voids. And that's the, yeah, that's a gorgeous. And you can actually see it's intrapericardial. So, I, I mean, it's really beautiful that that last scan. You can see the pericardium bending around it. And I don't know if I've seen one intrapericardial in this region. I've seen a bunch, as you say, above the left atrium. But that's uh, that's really nice. Um, yeah. In the AP window, we see them all the time. But having one actually... That, that's that's cool case yeah 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 so i'd, I'd read there um the, the thing that kind of threw me off was that i was worried about the rvot um and because I I, I I i there were a few places like like here for instance where i, I don't see the anterior wall the the right ventricle and so i was worried that it was invaded but it could just be compressed as well um so they, they went to the cath lab um to try and do uh, a biopsy and also to try and define the the vascularity of this and uh it had uh Pretty large collaterals from both the uh, RCA and the and the uh, and the left, um, as you can see here, very very vascular. Um, and I can't show you the actual cath lab images because of PHI, um, but there were tiny little tumor-like vessels uh, that were like you can see the contrast kind of dripping into it. Um, and there was a single branch uh, coming off the conus that only seemed to supply this. Um, and uh, uh, I, I I googled it, and there I guess there have been a few. Case reports of uh, different people doing um, preoperative uh, bland embolizations uh, for these before they go in and resect them um, to decrease the the risk of bleeding intraoperatively. But anyway, yeah. So that was just a follow. -up. So are they gonna now that they know? I mean, they've done ex images to exhaustion and done everything. And why are they even biopsying it? They just need to take it out. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, you know, I, I uh, yeah, the guy actually left AMA, um, and oh, well, uh, I don't. I, 
I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it'd be probably too too much of a, a house moment, but uh, uh, the tumor secretes dopamine, and the guy has a history of schizophrenia. So uh, I don't know if resecting that would would, would help his his dop his uh, schizophrenia or not. Um, but uh, at one point, he uh, he was deemed not to have medical decision making, but but he he regained it and is is now uh, somewhere out in the wild. So maybe he'll pop up in San Diego or, or San Francisco. Yeah, it's a nice case. Here's another cardiac mass. This is a guy with squamous cell carcinoma of the lung and uh, just, just a terrible uh, mass. You can see the, the, the left uh, uh, hemithorax is nearly completely filled, um, very little aerated lung left, and the heart shifted over to the left. Um, and uh, when you look at the axial images, you can see uh, areas of, of hypodensity from a non-viable tumor and then areas of uh, probably enhancing tumor. And here in the left atrium, you can see that the tumor is invaded into the left inferior uh, pulmonary vein and is now within the body of the left atrium. Um, and here's the, the, the PET CT images. I can't show you the fused ones because uh, of PHI. Um, but you can see uh, this, this area right here corresponds to this area in the left atrium of uh, tumor invading there. So no, not a diagnostic dilemma here, but uh, it's another good one. And then um, this one, um, it, uh, so I, I don't know. Is, I think David's on the David's on the line. Um, uh, our vascular surgeons here really like this this uh, classification that came out of uh, uh, Harborview uh, for blunt aortic injury, and I, I hadn't been terribly familiar with it before, um, but uh, I, I became with it uh, now. Um, and it, they basically separate blunt aortic injury into uh, four groups. Uh, there's uh, two types that are relatively minimal. They're mostly just kind of intimal disruption without a, a contour deformity. And then moderate is what they call when there's a, a usually a small pseudoaneurysm. And then severe when there's um, when there's a, a larger area where they're, they're calling it active extravasation or where there's a, a lar uh, uh, hematoma around the left subclavian artery greater than 15 millimeters. And, and they, the, the distinction between these two, both of them should get T-VARS at some point, is that um, a lot of these patients are usually pretty sick and uh, have uh, severe injuries. Um, and here they say the severe uh, BAI um, requires urgent repair regardless of everything else. Um, so this is, a, this is a case of a 25-year-old uh, man who was involved in a motor vehicle accident. Um, and you can see um, quite a bit of blood in the uh, in the chest. Um, and here's the the sagittal showing um, not only a, a pseudoaneurysm with a, a contour deformity, but then also um, probably some intimal irregularities uh, right here, which which kind of blossomed on a subsequent CTA um, into a more frank thrombus, as you can see uh, here. Um, and um, so this guy, they ended up not treating it. Now it's been about two weeks and he still hasn't been to the OR. Um, and I, I, the reason is, is because this is what his brain looks like. Um, and they were worried about anticoagulating him in the setting of this severe brain injury. And he's probably not going to survive the brain injury anyway. Um, I, I, you know, I, I hadn't been very familiar with this, this grading system before, but I'm not sure, you know, it, uh, would you guys include, uh, do you think you, uh, should should this be included, uh, this hemorrhage in the left subclavian uh, in this 15 millimeter measurement? Because that would then up this to a, a, a grade four as opposed to a grade three. Um, I think that blood up higher is more anterior and separate from the mm -hmm. aorta, so I don't know where that's coming from. Maybe the, so the blood may be coming from elsewhere, other structures that are injured small vessels or something else. Okay, oh, good. And then the, this last case, uh, this is a grade four injury. Um, uh, you can see here, clear, large contour deformity, um, a lot more blood in the chest, um, uh, really a uh, large amount of active, active extravasation. Just, you can't even really tell uh, where the aorta is anymore. Um, and this guy got a, a T-VAR um, and is, is doing well, though you can see uh, either a dissection or occlusion of the proximal left subclavian artery. So cool. those are my cases. No, oh, great ones. All right. Um, David, do you have any cases? Uh, no. All right. Not this week. Sorry. Howard, did you solve your issue? I, could, I, think, I, I think I have. I'm not certain. But All right. Fingers crossed. Here you go. 
Okay, that seems better, actually. Yes. Okay. So let me start with this one. Um, the diagnosis here is not elusive. There's a lot of disease, pulmonary and pleural, in the right hemiphorax in particular. Um, let me show you the CT. And if I had to say stop right there, if you had to choose one neoplasm that is metastatic in this fashion, just looking at this, I would just choose one for something that looks like that. Um, very enhancing. Let me show you, if you pay attention to particularly the right long thoracic artery and see the amount of parasitism of vessels from that dilated vessel to the pleural disease. And then if you go to the upper abdomen, you begin to see very dilated vessels again. And you can see there's a lot of tumor in the upper abdomen and it ought to be a renal cell cancer because they're often particularly very, very vascular tumors. This is that. So this is a very, very extensive disease, particularly in the right hemiothorax. This mix will show the extent of, I think parasitism is a reasonable word, of vessels from long thoracic artery in the right chest wall, as well as these very large vessels related to residual tumor, or recurrent tumor, I should say, in the upper abdomen as well. So metastatic renal cell cancer. So One thing that I, I'm interested in here, um, and this is speculation, but if you have a lot of blood flow going through the tumors and they can shunt very quickly, you can have effectively a shunt using from, or be a right to left, a left to right shunt. And if there's a lot of blood flow coming up from this in the abdomen, it might explain this dilated hemiazygous vein. Now the azygous vein is probably out, but that's a dilated hemiazygous vein carrying a lot of blood flow. Then it crosses the midline trying to get to the SVC. And that might represent in part the tremendous blood flow that is going through the vessels in the abdomen perhaps as well. Uh, Howard, what else is nice about your case is it looks like the timing of the contrast is sort of portal venous based on the abdomen. And I found that that's better when you're looking for pleural masses to um, do your scan at about a 60 second delay in the chest as opposed to the routine where we often have much more arterial or an early arterial yeah. phase because you well, often, especially much like better, fusion, much better. you can see the nodules enhance much better through the effusions. Yes. Yeah, these are from the outside, and you're absolutely right. The timing allows us to judge how much tumor enhancement we have and, and so on, exactly. This one is a really nice case for trainees. Um, I speculate that the imaging findings were perhaps not appreciated initially, so the same imaging findings are present in February and May. So let me put up the lateral projection from February alongside that and give everyone, particularly trainees, an opportunity to, to look for abnormality here. And they are relatively easy to go by. So there is abnormal opacity in the basal left hemithorax. And if you look for corresponding abnormality on the lateral projection, it's relatively elusive, but there is some abnormality here that goes along with that. But the reason I show this is because in a case like this, the direct and indirect signs of obstructive lobar atelectasis become really important. So for example, if you look at the location of the left hilum, 
the Baskerville Highland, the left form of the artery, it's slightly depressed and rotated medially. So it's gone down. And I'll make this a bit bigger. If you look at the vessels in the left lung, at a first glance, you may go right by this. But if you look at the vessels, not only is the highland depressed, but the vessels that are present here are small in caliber and they are separated apart. They are stretched apart. And that's a clue that these vessels here also are abnormal. And then a relatively subtle finding is the fact that the left main bronchus is more vertically oriented downward. So it's depressed a little bit as well. So of course, what I'm pointing out are direct and indirect signs of obstructive low bar atelectasis that are easy to go by. So for example, here on the, I made a slab over here. Um, you can see the same findings that I described in relation to the vessels the location of the left vascular hilum and the left main bronchus and so on. And here's the opacity right down there. So of course we have findings of obstructive lobar atelectasis and the etiology of it. I'll make this big. Here is the atelectatic lung down here. And yes, there's some material in the airways, but here is the offending lesion, which is right here. It's enhancing. And here's the corresponding bronch right there. And that indeed, of course, is a carcinoid. That's the most common lesion that one would see. So a nice example of obstructing carcinoid tumor located right there. So a really nice teaching case, particularly of signs of obstructive lobar atelectasis or collapse. All right, let me show you. This one. this one's kind of interesting. Um, the observation here in this person in relation to planned surgery was made um, in the context of a CT obtained for planning. And the observation relates to the fact that there's a new nodule. So this is January and that is May. And this small nodule was seen and it was noticed to be a new nodule. So it's a differential diagnosis of not just an SVN, but one that has evolved in just a couple of months. And this was biopsy. That was a pretty good biopsy that they went for that. And they got that. And here's the path report. It's interesting. So the initial path report shows a necrotizing granulomatous process. And of course, infection, infection is what pathologists immediately think of. Performed the stains, they were negative but then grew Mycobacterium and Zassii. So an interesting development of a small nodule of that Mycobacterium. Don't know why, but just an interesting case, not cancer, but this. This one is um, instructive because it's easy to go by this. So I came across this in the context of one CT scan that I read that was evaluate empyema, paranormonic effusion empyema. So the diagnosis that I got was left lower load pneumonia and paranormonic effusion, which they had drained. So I will show you images from the chest here. So just very briefly, you can see there is a pleural drainage tube. Here is some atelectatic lung. And of course, usually I'm thinking, okay, they want to know about the distribution and the locations, the location distribution, and the amount of residual pleural fluid in this context of left lower load pneumonia with paranormonic effusion. So a couple of things, if this is a paranormonic or a paranormonic pneumonia with paranormonic effusion, we don't really see consolidation. So I didn't like the pneumonia. Um, of course, you can have an empyema without seeing the consolidation. But what I want to show you now is, let me just go forward in time. Well, I'll show you the findings in this CT because they're easier to see. But if you're in a situation where you're looking through that and you don't get anchored to all the pleural fluid and just report that, um, you might go by this. So if you have someone with particularly an idiopathic pleural effusion, Anytime you see this kind of pleural thickening, 
um, here in the anterior hemithorax. And there was an area here that is paravertebral, pearl thickening, and pearl thickening here again, um, away from the pearl fluid, uh, particularly in the context of an so-called idiopathic effusion, although this was attributed to Empire Mahwari. And I will obviously tell you right now that that turned out not to be a paranormonic effusion. That is a desmoplastic mesothelioma. So ultimately, they puzzled over the fact, and someone was appropriately concerned that this was not a pneumonia with paranormonic effusion based on, I'm not entirely sure what. So this is a mesothelioma. So I always try to remember and teach my residents, particularly if you have a plural diffusion of unknown or perhaps uncertain cause, the more plural thickening that you see like that, that involves plural surfaces like that and plural surfaces like that, even if small, worry about mesothelioma like that. Oh, All right, it also looks like... Yeah. It also looks Pardon? like the, the right posterior extra pleural fat is a little hypertrophied in the, the, the arteries there. The intercostal arteries are also a little bit large. Yeah, that doesn't really help me that home much. But what worries me is this lobulated pleural thickening right there. Right? Mm -hmm. It looked, and uh, look, Howard, I think I saw a plaque on the left, and I think there may be some. No, I was looking for that, here. so I'm not sure that I saw it, but I was looking for pleural flats. Up high. Up high, somewhere up high, could, could, but yeah. maybe keep going up, 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 up. Yeah. anterior left. Keep going, uh, right along, right along, underneath that uh, that rib. Um, keep maybe going a little, higher, a little higher. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a little plaque right there um, between ribs, but it's that's pretty iffy. Yeah, that's a bit hard. But um, you know, about 40, 47 percent of cases don't have pleural plaques of meso. Even yeah. th then, the question always is: is it is it related to asbestos exposure at all? You can't tell radiographically anymore. Yeah, right. Sometimes I find the other projections useful. So of course, here we see pleural fluid, fine. But when I start to see this, yeah, and the pleural thickening, I worry, as I mentioned before. Another thing that's fairly common with meso is invasion of the anterior mediastinal fat. It seems to like to just go right into that, that fat. So if I see blobs in the fat adjacent to the pleural tumor, it's, anyway, uh, yes, that's exactly. that it's malignancy. Yeah, see this pearl thickening right up there too. Yeah, see, I don't like that when I see this. So again, very instructive case. It took a while to make the diagnosis. This prognosis is not going to be affected. It took a couple of months, but that's what the diagnosis is. All right, Jeff. All right, excellent case, thanks. All right, I've just got two, one quick one and one less quick one. Um, All right. Okay, so this is uh, someone mute. Whoever's MM, I think you need to yeah, mute. I'm, I'm mute there we go. It's good to be. It's good to be king sometimes. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so this is a patient who had a PET scan for melanoma or something for a little lung nodule, but they noticed these funny-looking lymph nodes on the PET scan. So. Um, uh, regular chest CT was done. You can see they're really dense, but they're not necessarily calcified density and it's homogeneous. It's not the icing sugar you see with sarcoid where it's more central. It's filling the entire lymph nodes. They're otherwise normal. And so uh, we, I think we've shown a couple cases of this, but when I see dense lymph nodes that aren't calcified, I think about uh, metal exposure and inhalation. So it just took a few minutes of digging actually to find it, uh, not where occupational history is recorded in the chart, but buried in an H&P that some more thorough hospital has done at a previous time. This guy was a welder for 20 years. So this is an example of just iron accumulation in, in the lymphatics. He does not have the nodules we often see, the central lobular ground glass nodules, 
associated with siderosis, just a mild emphysema. So purely an incidental finding. They weren't, of course, FDG Abbott. Um, we've seen cases in aluminum workers. Uh, you can see dense lymph nodes with pneumoconiosis too from um, coal and silica uh, as one of the earlier findings, but I've not seen them this dense without some lung nodules. But it's just the accumulation, the lungs are able to clear that much dust at that time. So an, an example of that. And then my other case. Look, looks very similar. Yes, to what I happened to send me a, us a case today on I have a, text chat. So this text is. Text exactly the same today. I had. I know I'm looking. He's no, I, I page people. No one's of course calls me back, but I put in my dictation that it's, you know, associated with history. But no, it's just it looks identical. Yeah, it does. That's I just it was so yeah. funny you could send it. Yeah. Jeff, did the iron get elsewhere? Did it get into the liver or spleen or something like that? Uh, was no, I don't, I don't. I can go look again. I don't recall. I don't remember seeing it. And the PET CT went far enough down. Um, I don't think he had that much. I mean, 20 years is a lot, but because it, it didn't even have it in his lungs. Nah, see, liver, spleen looked fine. So it's all good in the lungs. Um, so this is a, a young female, 37 years old, who um, uh, was just really sick, hypercoagulable and uh, had known DVTs, um, but the reason that they decided to scan the chest is the, um, the extent of hypoxia was just out of proportion to what they were expecting and trying to decide if there, would need, if there were PEs, enough of them, would they do some sort of lysis or clot removal? Um, but the reason I'm showing this case is it's, it shows a couple of things. So first of all, there's a big blob, to quote David here, in the right atrial appendage. So there's a huge thrombus in the right atrium. But then there's another one here in the left atrium, and it's uh, clearly separate. I was trying to figure out if she had a patent foramen ovale, but you can see she's got a marked bowing of the interatrial septum. You call it an aneurysm or whatever, but comp almost compressing this pulmonary vein here. So there's really high right heart pressures at this time. So if there were a PFO, I'd expect it to blow it open and decompress. So I think this is a, a separate thrombus forming along the posterior wall of the left ventricle. And she was having strokes, uh, so it all fits with the uh, clot on the left side. But what's impressive is she's got these a dinky little PE here, and she had one other little one. Look at the right lower lobe. It's just, it's just. I mean, that looks like infarcted, but it looks like the entire lower lobe is just not perfused, and it's infarcting. Uh, it's just not, there's no enhancement at all. There's very diminished uh, venous return. There's a little bit of contrast in the superior segment there. Um, there's no big clot going into it. You see the right pulmonary artery just kind of goes in that one little area of it. And then the same thing on the other side, the posterior segment here is enhancing, but this sort of lateral and anterior medial basal segment are, sort, are in the process of infarcting, which would explain the profound hypoxia. Uh, on top of that, I think that was it. She ended up having more strokes and, and not a good outcome, but uh, this is just impressive thrombus. But I, have, I don't know about you guys, but I've never seen, short of a venous infarct, usually from a staple line or a torsion, I have never seen this much lack of perfusion I presume she had the in situ thrombus probably in that most of that lower lobe pulmonary area. I just can't see it because it, there's no contrast distal to it. So is her coagulopathy, uh, is this COVID? Would she, did she go to one of those parties to? Uh... No, she was not a COVID. Um, I don't remember what her underlying problem was, but I think she was presenting with strokes and all that, and that's what started it. Hmm. So I, I don't know if she had some underlying thing um, that predisposed her, but it seems to, uh, what came first, I don't know, but I yeah, I think just this extent of of, um, of infarct or non-perfusion, whatever you want to call it, in these lower lobes is just it's pretty impressive. This is a younger person too. I think she was in her late thirties. Jeff, can you scroll through that right pulmonary artery? When does it disappear? And how does yeah, it, it disappear? sort of just disappears. I mean, you see the upper lobe branches, and then you see the interlobar. There's the middle lobe branch coming off, and you just kind of lose it. You get the superior segment, and right there, it looks like there may be an occlusion, but the fissure's back here, so I'm not sure what's going on. I couldn't see distal to it. On the other side, same kind of thing. You can follow the left pulmonary artery down, and then it branches, but then you sort of lose it. There's a little filling defect there, but if that's real or slow, but you just see out here, there's just no perfusion. Could it, could it be torsed? Both of them? I, oh, I wait, I didn't see. Is there another area I was well, kind of having? Right, low, low. But looking at the airways, the airways are fine. I mean, that's what I usually rely on. So there's 
bronchus intermedius, middle lobe comes off. There's supseg, middle lobe, basal. Yeah. Trunk. Okay. Yeah. So it's and not the worst. Yeah, you can see the pulmonary ligament and everything. So everything is in the right place. It's just and infarcting. Here's it in a little different way. Perhaps there's extensive, um, extensive in situ thrombosis of the pulmonary vessels as well as the clot in those other in the cardiac chambers. That's what I'm thinking. This is all a lot of in situ thrombosis. I mean, she had DVTs, but this doesn't look like your typical pulmonary emboli that fragment and give you peripheral infarcts. And then you've got a, a, a thrombus in the left atrium, which clearly is forming there and probably not coming from anywhere else. And I mean, there is a PE right there, but it's a little tiny thing. So anyway, it's just, it's an impressive case of thrombosis. Yeah, very much so. Gosh. All right. The clinical contest would be very helpful in this case. And you know, she looks as if she's got a lot of muscle wasting. I wonder if she's on steroids for some chronic autoimmune condition or something. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't remember if there was that. Clearly she was having right heart dysfunction with the ascites, the anasarca. Yeah. Wild. All right. Well, thanks everybody. It's uh, top of the hour. So uh, have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you.